Hi guys, sorry you guys couldn't be here. I am I know you guys are all watching online. Thank you for tuning in and we're just going to start with a couple of songs of worship. worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. And break every chain, oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom, awake and alive Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high Oh God, you have done great things You'll be faithful forevermore You have done great things And I know you will do it again For your promise is yes and amen You will do great things God, you do great things
broken for the sins of the earth all because of your love all because of your love because of your cross my debt is paid because of your blood my sins are washed away now all of Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we get to have the opportunity to still watch online, Lord, and just to um, hear your word, Lord. And I pray that you go before Scott as he gives this message today, Lord. And I pray that you just um, watch over everybody as they go about their day at home, Lord, whatever they um, have planned, Lord. I pray that you just use this time to um, build up relationships with families, Lord, that um, maybe aren't there when we when we are out doing our own things, Lord. And I pray that you just... Um, Use this time, Lord, to help us to seek you more, Lord. And we thank you for this day, and we thank you for everything that you do for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening, and welcome back to Calvary Chapel Golden Springs and to the Resistance High School Ministry as well as the gathering. I want to welcome you guys, at least at home, while you're sitting at home in your pajamas, in your sweats, probably watching this. That's cool. I wish I was, but I'm here making content for you guys and teaching the word. Wish you guys were here. I can't wait for this whole thing to blow over so we can actually have fellowship and I can see your faces face to face instead of Instagram and FaceTime. I actually get to see you guys face to face, but I hope you guys are doing well, you and your families. And this is an awesome book, you guys. We're going through the book of 1 John. We have two more chapters before we finish this book, and then we'll get into the book of 2 John, which I'm super excited about. But let's bow in a word of prayer, and I'm going to pray for you guys. Lord, bless these guys, Lord. Bless all these people, Lord God, these young people and all those that are listening online. Bless them and their families during this time of crisis, Father, during this time of of heart searching, and I pray, Father, there'd be a time that we could really draw near to each other and draw near to you. As, Father, we're taking this time just to be just quiet, simple. The computer, the phone could take so much time, but, Lord, just let us sit alone with you and just thinking about your goodness, Lord God, and what you're trying to do through this whole situation. So bless this time. Bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So open up your Bibles to First John 
chapter 4, you guys. And as we continue with our study through the book of 1 John, last week, if you remember, that we uh, left off in chapter 3, where we uh, beheld the love of God. In other words, we just like just focused on the love of God and how it is manifested towards us and how does God reveal his love to us. But here tonight, you guys, we're going to see through God's love as it is manifested through us. So it's one thing that he manifested to us. Now we're going to see God's love manifested through us. Because in other words, as God shows his love to us, what does that do? That makes us receive that love and say, all right, cool. Now we take on that spirit of love and we say, okay, now I want to manifest that external. We want to begin to, to spread that love around. And so how is God's love being manifested through us? And that's what's going to be our study and our focus tonight. So let's start off, you guys, in the book of 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. He says, Beloved, do, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world, and by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come into the in, in flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, Christ, the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is already in the world. You are God's little children and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us, and he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know that the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So the first first six verses in 1 John chapter 4 is all about love testing spirits. Now love is not blind. And that's what I entitled that little section there. Love is not blind. Love has to test all things. I've heard people say this before, and you've heard me say it before, that a love not tested is a love not trusted. Same thing with a faith. A faith not tested is a faith not trusted. Put that in an example. If someone says they love you, but they're constantly doing things that hurt you and upset you and disappoint you, could you say they really love you or do they love themselves more? Because love is all about focusing on others, not yourself, right? And so when you have a friend that you've had a long time and all of a sudden they do something that maybe disappoints you, upsets you, and it's not just one thing, it's a constant thing. Do they really have your best interest and your love uh, and love for you uh, in their minds and in their hearts prim- primarily? And, and you'd have to take a step back and look at that. And, and the same thing applies with our love towards God. If we say we love God, and he said this in the first two or three chapters that we've been talking about, he says, if you say you love God, but then the things that you say or do are contrary to the love of God and his conduct that he, that he states in his word, then is our love true? And that's something for us to look at in ourselves. We say we're Christians. We say we believe in Jesus. We, we say we love his word. But then how often do we mistreat those that are around us? And how often do we mistreat those that we work with or go to school with? And how do we um, represent ourselves to our neighbors and people around us? I mean, those are super important things. Because Christianity and love is not internal. A lot of people just keep their Christianity and their love for God inside. They hide it. But the truth is it needs to be manifested outside. And he even said that when the love of God begins to wash over you, that, that, that living water begins to be a fountain that, that springs forth into everlasting life. Now, you can't hide a fountain. Once that water spraying out, it's not like you're going to hide that. And so that's something that we need to think about in our lives right here. And so we, we hear that, that love gets put to the test. Real love, it gets put to the test. And, and that's the first six verses. Our love is, te- and he says to test all spirits. Now, there are many spirits in the world today, but there is only one spirit of God. But there are many deceiving spirits in the world. And he talked about this right here, that we would know the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now, the spirit of error is the Antichrist who has been around from the very beginning. And you know this, he is Satan, and he's inspired by Satan. And what he does is basically gets people to disbelieve or to lose their faith or to think there might be another way to get to God or some other way of righteousness or some other practices or beliefs that you can practice or, 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 or believe in that are going to get you to a, a place with God. But we know that that's not true. If it were true, then Jesus would not have said that I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. So he's very specific. He's very specific. Now, I like this, deceiving spirits and doctrines. He talked about this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And he says, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, uh, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. 
speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared as with a hot iron. Now we see that today. How many false religions are there out there that are similar to Christianity, but their beliefs and their philosophies are just enough to get them completely off from the person and the work of Jesus Christ? That's incredible. There are lots of different offshoots and sects and, 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 and cults that are out there that claim to be Christian. There are even some old uh, cults that are out here nowadays that are claiming that they're Christian now. Oh yeah, we're Christians. We've always been Christian. But when you ask them about the person of Jesus Christ, and he says it in these first six verses, anybody that denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, they'll say, no, Jesus Christ did come in the flesh, but he's not God. And this is what John is trying to say here. Anyone that says that Jesus Christ is not God come in the flesh is not a believer, is not a true believer, and they do not know God and they are the Antichrist. So understand that that is the difference between us, Christians, born-again believers, and the rest of the world. Do they believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, God, and King? Do they believe that He is God in the form of man that came down, laid down His life, took it up again, and then thus solidified a place of, uh, in heaven for you and me? That uh, His blood washed away all of our sins. If they don't believe that, the person of Jesus, count them as a curse, the Bible says very clearly. He says, test all things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says that we need to test all things. Just as I talked to you earlier, test your relationships. Marriages, they say marriages, the first one or two years of the marriages is a testing time, getting to know one another, trying to figure out each other's uh, uh, flows and, and, and goes, so to speak, or ebbs and flows. We need to figure out everyone's weaknesses and strengths, and the same thing is, is testing our Christianity, but not just the first two years. The entirety of our Christian walk is going to be tested every day because God wants to make sure that we're solid, that we're strong. And to be honest with you, we need to test ourselves. How strong is my love for God and how strong is my love for other people? And I'm not talking about any emotions. That's not what I'm talking about. And our conduct and the way that we exercise that love. Because I've said this last week, that love is not a word. It's an action. It's a conduct. It's a, it's a sacrifice. John 3, 16, for God so loved, he gave. So his degree of love was so much that he sacrificed. And that's what God wants us to be and wants us to do. They test all things. 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 through 22. Do not despise prophecies, but test all things and hold fast for what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. I like what he says there. Abstain from those things. False teachers in Acts chapter 20, he might mention this too. In Acts chapter 20, verses 20 through 30, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among you, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves now think about what he's saying there he this is him talking about in the last days but here we are and we see these things happening today so many people are being caught up by false teachings false doctrines false philosophies teaching in the universities some of your professors are teaching oh there's no such thing as god um evolution is the key or uh, humanism is the key or science or knowledge is the key which is gnosticism and we see those things procreate now John wrote this to combat those things that were going on then, but as we know, God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is the same. That his word also applies today. God foreknew that these things were going to be happening in the last days. As a matter of fact, he said so. Then in the last days, men will be like given over to deception. He says these things. And this is why he writes these things to us through John. It says, they examine the scriptures daily. The Bereans were people that when Paul and the disciples came preaching, these guys would sit in the back and they would go over what was said before in scriptures and matching and mismatching and, and, and making sure that everything they said were fact-checking everything. And I don't think it's wrong to be that way. I don't think we need to be skeptics. I don't think we need to go in every church and say, oh, you said something wrong because we can be very critical at times and we don't need to be critical. But we do need to test all things. Is, is the church that you're going to, are they preaching the word? Are they preaching the word without compromise? Are there areas where they're kind of steering away from? Are you yourselves maybe, you know, not getting into certain parts of the word because you feel it's going to be convicting towards your lifestyle? And this is something we need to make sure too, is the word of God is all-inclusive when it comes to sin, but it's also all-inclusive when it comes to love. God hates all sin, and he deals with all sin the same way, 
but he also loves the sinner and wants them to be saved and to repent for their sins. We need to make sure of that because we're really good at hating the sin. But then sometimes people look at that and say that we also hate the sinner. We don't. We love all people. We hate sin in their lives. We hate sin in our lives just as God does. But we want all of us to repent and to turn to God and have his love uh, bless our lives. And that's what the whole key is right there. I like what he says right here. They were eyewitnesses of his, of his, of his love and of his truth. Now remember this. Uh, well, let me get back to the Bereans. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were true or so. Do you search the scriptures daily? I mean, we need to be those people, to be honest with you, they get in the Word every day. It doesn't need to be a Bible study. You sit there and study for 16 hours. Some of us don't have the time. But right now, actually, everybody has time, right? So take some time to sit alone and just meditate on a couple of verses and allow God to minister to you. Either audio books, uh, the audio Bible, the, the uh, one year through the Bible, uh, reading the Scriptures, a devotional book. But make sure that you guys are getting a steady dose of the Word of God. And, and by the way, on devotional books, love devotional books. But remember this, devotional books is someone else's pieces of their devotion than they're sharing it with you and me. How much better when we're reading through God's word in its entirety and we're writing down little devotions that God is giving to us. That's one of the beautiful things about this whole shutdown is I'm watching a lot of the young people out there. They're getting on the FaceTimes, they're getting on the Zooms, they're getting on the, the Instagrams, and they're posting things as God is ministering to them. And we see so much of God being poured out in these people's lives, and I'm loving, because you know what it's doing? It's making people go to their knees, and that's where God wants us. Not in brokenness and humility, sometimes, yes, but more so in devotion. And you guys, we, we get our best stuff. We get our best um, food for giving out to other people when we receive from God ourselves. So make sure, like the Bereans, that you're searching the scriptures daily to find out what God wants to say to you, and, and also which you can give out to people that are going to come to you and, and that are hurting and they need some hope. So this is an, a great opportunity. I like right here in 1 John 1, 1 through 4, these are the eyewitnesses. We talked about this a couple of verses, uh, chapters ago. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, that we, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that the eternal life which was with the Father was manifested to us, which we have seen, heard, we declare to you, that you may, be, that you may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is, fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, uh, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. I like the fact, you guys, that He's proving all things. Why? Because they themselves witnessed it. Now, Personal witness is not another a test alone. I know people that have experienced some amazing things, and thus they build doctrines and philosophies around what they experience. I myself have seen some weird things before I was a Christian. Now, I could come up with all kinds of different things if I were religiously messed up. I could say, these things are of God, but now I realize those were deceptions. So we need to make sure that even the experiences that we experience, we test them against the Word of God and make sure that they're solid, that they're doctrinal. But these guys here, there's John and, and all the rest of the disciples saying, hey, we're witnesses. We're, we're giving you the example or the, uh, the witness of what we ourselves have seen, heard, and, 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 and seen with our own eyes regarding the, the conduct and the things of Jesus. So that's a good thing, too. And then they say, then he talks about the Antichrist. Remember he little talked about the Antichrist, the spirit of error. The spirit of error is anything or anyone or any organization or any philosophy, any teaching, any science that is against the word of God. Yes, I said science, because science in itself can be a religion. I look at evolution as a, a religion, because people teach that we came from monkeys. And if that's the case, then why are all the monkeys in the zoos still monkeys and they haven't evolved eventually into men? And, and if we're constantly evolving, what does man evolve into? And they never give you an answer for that question. I've watched goldfish never evolve into an alligator, and alligators not evolve into uh, little people. I digress. What I'm trying to say is evolution in its face is, is a pretty dumb argument to say because it doesn't logically nor scientifically even make sense when you analyze the facts of evolution. But I will say this. They are so diehard in their belief system and they believed all this junk that they now begin to profess it and spread it around and basically brainwash students and kids in classes that this is true. 
yet they will not go back to the Word of God that says that all men are created by God, that we are His creation, that He formed us out of the dust of the earth. I mean, they don't want to go there. But the truth is, you guys, man in his lawlessness, you guys, it says in 2 Thessalonians, he's going to talk about the spirit of Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, 3, 8 says, And let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, meaning the day of the Lord, will not come unless a falling away first comes, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. This is the Antichrist, the, the Satan himself. He who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship. Notice that. He's against the things of God and the things that are traditionally that we worship. It says, so that he uh, sits as God in the temple and the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And do you do not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things. Does that not sound familiar? In Ezekiel, we have the uh, image of Lucifer being raised up and he wants to sit and literally become God. He says the five eyes, I will do this, I will do this, I will rise up, I'll be above the angels of the Most High, I will sit on the mount of, 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 of God. And he's the same thing. This Antichrist, this devil, who was in heaven uh, and was cast down, is now upon earth, and he's spitting the same lies. As a matter of fact, he spit the same lies to Eve in the Garden of Eden when he said, you will be like gods if you eat the fruit. And man has been taking his life in his own hands and being his own God for a very long time, to no avail, he's screwing it all up. Verse 6 says, And now you know what is restraining, talking about the Holy Spirit restraining, holding back, that he may be revealed in his own time. In other words, and then he says, For the mystery of the lawless is already at work. Only he who restrains, again the Holy Spirit, the restrainer, will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now we know that the Holy Spirit is removed from working in the lives of, of the church, and then his focus will be on the Jewish church when the rapture takes place. Remember that. That right now we are in, living in the time of the Gentiles and the Holy Spirit is holding back all the forces of hell right now. But when God releases his hand, he calls all the Christians home. And remember now, the Spirit will not be present on earth here. It will be mo mostly focusing on the nation of Israel and the remnant that is left over. And now, get this. Now, let's say you're hypothetically you're a non-believer or you are a backslidden believer. At the time of the rapture, when the church is taken up and you're left behind, you will know exactly what is going on. They say that there's going to be more believers that are going to be converted during the time of the rapture than any time in the past. But here's the difference. Here you have the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that gives you the gifts of the Spirit. Those things will not be manifested on earth anymore because the work of the Spirit will not be working in the Gentile church anymore. It will be like it was before Jesus came, and you must believe solely by faith. And now your faith will be tested because the enemy will be at full work and have full power upon the earth at that time. You will have to believe strictly by faith and nothing more. No signs, no wonders, no gifts, no spirits, no tongues, none of those things. You will just have to manifest God's love uh, undercover for the most part until either you lose your head or basically the Lord comes back to overthrow everything and redo everything again if you live through the tribulation. That being said, though, it's so hard right now with the Holy Spirit. I can't imagine people doing it without the Spirit in the last days. But he says, For the mystery of the lawless one is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his, uh, with his, with his mouth, breath of his mouth, and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So we see here that God is going to deal with him in the end as well. Then we have here, point number two, you guys, is knowing God through his love, verses 7 through 11. Verses 7 through 11, let's read that there. And I like what he says. Behold, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And he who does not, uh, does not love does not know God, and for God is love. And this is the love of God, which was manifested towards us. Now he begins to give the example of it. Um, he says, now this was a love that was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that through him we might live through him. And this is a love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. There's that word again. We covered that about a week or so ago. The propitiation. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love 
one another. Now that word propitiation, I'll go over it for some of you guys that weren't listening last week. The propitiation literally means substitutionary death. He becomes the sacrifice for yours and my sins. He took our place on the cross. As we talked about it last week when we were talking about the advocate, he's not only our defense lawyer, he's also our, uh, the one that basically pays for the, 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 the sin or the condemnation of the sin, the, the charges for the sin that we commit. So he, he stands there and argues our case before God. He fights against the devil and puts him down. And then once the judgment is handed down, Jesus himself takes a place uh, in, in our place in judgment and thus died for us and was resurrected. That's why we call him not only the advocate, but also the propitiation for our sins. And I love this. He says that in this, in this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. Now, how do we know God's love? That was the perfect example. The Bible says that love great, knows no greater than he who is willing to lay down his life for his friends. And that's what he did. So his love was manifested uh, through, he, he was, we, we could know God through his love that is manifested towards us in his actions. His words are one thing. If Jesus and God were to, to speak to us uh, great swelling words of love but never manifested that love, it would just be empty words. But everything he said is everything that he did and vice versa. He always backs his word with conduct and his conduct with his word. He goes hand in hand. He's perfectly in balance. And that's how we need to be with the Lord. I like what he says this. He took the initiative to choose us. And how did he choose us? In Ephesians 1, he chose us when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. That, and that's always something that's blown me away. When we were at our worst, he already picked us out like, hey, I want to save these people. And it wasn't just individuals. He wants to save all of mankind, but not all of mankind wants to be saved. Some people believe that God picks certain people for hell and certain people for heaven. Not true. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish. In other words, if you were to translate that, it literally says that God did not want any of them to perish. But here's the, here's the difference. He doesn't want any to perish. He wants all of them to come to repentance. But the truth is not everybody is going to respond to his call to righteousness and holiness. For example, Jesus used the parable of the, of the man that, the rich man that was going to throw a big feast. And he tells his servants go out, his messengers, go out and tell all my friends I'm going to have a big feast. And one by one they go out and they tell all these people and then they come back to the master and they say, Master, we told them all and this is what they said. One man said he just got married, he wants to spend time with his wife. One guy said he has a, a new piece of land, he hasn't farmed it yet, he wants to take care of that. One of them said his father is dying, wants to take care of him. The other one says, you know, uh, they're all making excuses. And the landowner is like, oh, yeah, fine. Uh, the wealthy man says, fine. Forget them. Go out into the highways and the byways. I want you to go into one of the alleyways, the streets. I want you to invite people I don't even know and invite them to my feast. And he did, and the party was raging. It was a huge celebration. It was a huge success. But now, as the party's going on, as this big festivity's going on, all those that were invited hear it, and they come down, they begin to knock on the door, and they say, sorry, man, you missed your chance. In other words, you, we invited you, and you didn't want to come, and now the door is closed to you, and the Bible says, Jesus says there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, that's a loose paraphrase of the parable, but that's exactly what he's talking about. He gives the opportunity for everybody to receive him, for anybody to serve him, for everybody to come in and, and, and receive of the blessings and the joy and the benefits of having a loving relationship with the Father, but they don't want it. And that's the truth. They don't want it. And so this is what he's talking about here, knowing God through his love. Ephesians 1, 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, and having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So he knew from the very beginning, before the earth was ever created, who would and who would not receive and reject, but he made a way of escape through his son Jesus Christ that through him we could have redemption, you guys, and we could have a blessing in heaven and be forgiven for our sins. And that's the beautiful thing. I like this. He did not choose us because, you know, again, going back to the premise that people think, oh, he chose these people because they were good or they're not. He chose the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is this big compared to the rest of the world around them. And he didn't choose Israel because they were good people because they had done anything righteous. As a matter of fact, he chose them because they were the worst. 
And that's how he chooses you and me. That's what blows me away. He chooses the, the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. That's always blown me away. I don't get that. You'd think he would choose the righteous to show forth his righteousness, right? Just like when he chose Paul to preach to the Gentiles and Peter to the Jews. Paul was like a, a, a scholar. Paul was like a, a Pharisee, a Pharisee of Pharisees. It would have made sense to choose Paul to minister to his own people, but that's not how he works. He flips everything upside down and inside out to show you that it's not you, it's him. And this is what he does here. He says he did not choose Israel because they were good. He chose them, why? Because they were bad. Let me read it to you in, in Deuteronomy 7, 7, 9. He doesn't say he chose them. He chose them because he loved them. It has nothing to do with their conduct. Look what it says. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than the other people. For you were the least of the peoples, but because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out of the mighty, of, of the mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenants and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. I love that. See that little caveat at the end? For those that love him and keep his commandments. He blesses us. Does he bless those that don't? Yeah, but in a different way. God chooses his people based on his love for them, not their love for him. But let me tell you something. Once he pours his love on you, now he wants to see the reciprocation of that love. How do you respond to it? You guys know. Um, spoiled kids. Their parents love on them, dote on them, give them everything. But how do the kids turn into little monsters, right? Because they don't understand that their parents are doing this because they love them. But sometimes, you guys, we can look at love as like a cheap thing. Like, oh, they're just going to love me regardless of what I say or do. And a lot of people think of God like that. Oh, God loves me. And they just continue in their sins forever. God's like, no, that's not what I have for you. I love you, and I want you to reciprocate. In other words, respond to my love in like fashion. That's what he wants. Love spawns love. Hatred spawns hatred. Do you get what I'm saying here? God is pouring forth his love so that we will turn around and go, why do you love me when I'm such a sinner, when I'm such a wretch? And it makes us love him more, and it makes him just pour his blessing upon us even more and more and more. Where, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. But then again, Paul says, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. In other words, just because God loves us and we know he's going to forgive us doesn't mean we can continue to sin. Well, God's going to bless me. We should be like, God loves me so much. I don't want to grieve him. I don't want to upset him and thus turn from our ways, re reciprocate and respond to his love in like fashion of obedience. You're going to hear me say that a lot. Love equals sacrifice equals obedience. They go hand in hand. You can't have love without sacrifice and obedience. They go hand in hand. And that's the point that he's trying to prove here. I like this. Christ, for our sakes, became poor. Remember this. When it says he became poor, it's not like he was a rich man in heaven. He was, but that's not what he's talking about. And 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, meaning rich in heavenly things. He literally left the kingdom of God and came down and became a man. This is what he's talking about. He left a all his spiritual blessings, all his heavenly blessings aside to come down and minister to us through dying for our sins. He became poor that through his poverty might be, you might become rich. I like that. He's basically given up everything so that we can have everything. I love that. And that's the way that we need to be. We need to sacrifice for other people, right? We need to sacrifice for this dying world. What can we give up so that the world might know God's love? I think about that. That's a really heavy question to ask. I think about that a lot. What could I do better or what can I sacrifice that other people would see Jesus in me more? That's a really good question. I want to get into all the specifics of that. I'll let you meditate on that one. I like this one. In James 1, 17 and 18, he says, every good thing we have is from God. You ever think, you ever sit and think and count your blessings, especially during a time like this? I'm looking at my cupboard, and I'm looking at all the food that God has blessed us with. I'm looking at my healthy children for the most part. I'm looking for our home right now, and the roof is not leaking, and we have electricity right now. And I'm like, God, you're so good. And th those are the basic things, right? Let's say you're in a place where you don't even have those things. But let you do look at the blessings that God has given you. And understand the thing. Every good 
and precious gift is from the Lord. He says this in James. Every good and precious or perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I love that, that God has poured blessings on us so much, you guys, that it just shows his love for us constantly. And he, and he proves it in that, in that verse in James. Now, remember the Day of Atonement, the Day of, of Atonement in the Old Testament, where is where uh, all the men of the family and the families would basically come once a year to the temple of God. They would leave a sacrifice there in a nutshell, and thus their sins were forgiven for one year. Now, the Bible says that the priests, as they received those offerings, so to speak, they themselves had to be holy as they're receiving the offerings, and then they themselves had to offer offerings for themselves for their own sinfulness, and then thus they would go in and leave these sacrifices. But the word atonement means to cover, to be at one minute, to atone for. If you recall in the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve had sinned, um, <laughs> they basically, when, they, when God was looking for them and he found out they were naked, what does he do? He literally makes clothing for them out of the, the skins, of, or makes tunics out of the skins of animals. So in the very beginning, God showed Adam and Eve that the only way to cover their sins or their nakedness was the death or the, blo- the spilling of blood. And the Bible tells us that. Without the spilling of blood, there is no remission of sin. Okay? So God showed this to Adam and Eve from the beginning. He showed it to Cain and Abel. And thus, this from that point on, we've always recognized that sacrifice had to be of blood. Innocent blood, pure blood. And God was the first one to do that, to show them the example. But what we see here, you guys, is that Jesus actually became that lamb, that atonement lamb. Matter of fact, remember, when Jesus was with his disciples out near the Sea of Galilee, or out near the, the, the wilderness area, and you recall uh, John the Baptist was out there with his disciples too, near the Jordan, I'm sorry. And John the Baptist's uh, disciples were standing there with John, and John sees Jesus walking, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, that was a revolutionary statement because an atonement did not mean took away. An atonement means to paint over, to cover it. What he was saying is Jesus is the better way. He doesn't just paint over those sins. He doesn't cover them. He takes them away completely, which is why John's disciples now left John and they began to follow Jesus because they saw that Jesus is the better way. Now, with that being said, I like what he says this year. Jesus is our atonement in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 15. He says, Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, being or bring its blood inside the veil, and do what the blood as uh, do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So the priest would go in once a year, he would take the blood of that lamb, he would go behind the curtain, the holiest of holies, that only the priest could go in the presence of God, and he would sprinkle that bowl, he'd take that bowl of of blood, dip a a branch of hyssop in there, and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And when he came out, that man's sins were forgiven for one year. It was atonement, okay? But he's saying right here, and this is what he's saying, Paul's saying to the Ephesians is is that Jesus, excuse me, um, Leviticus is saying is that Jesus actually becomes our our, our atonement lamb. And we know this, but he is, he, they call him the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. This is what John the Baptist said. We see that he also, you guys, that we're seated with the Holy Spirit. We have a place at the right hand of God. In Ephesians 1.13, in him, meaning in Christ, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom we, having believed, uh, believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, and that is the guarantee of the promise. It's almost like when you get a gallon of milk, it has that expiration date, so to speak, but also has a USDA uh, choice on uh, stamp on meats and also a dairy one on the milk. It shows you that it's fresh and it's good up to a certain time, right? It's sealed. You can trust in that seal. Well, God has put his seal upon you and me, and it's 100% proven that we belong to him. And the proof of that is the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. And he will continue until either we die or the Holy or the Lord comes back first and, and redeems us. Either way. Three, you guys, we see God through his love. Verses 12 through 16. Let's read that. It says, Now, no one has seen God at any time. 
And if we love one another, God abides or lives in us. And his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he abides in us because he has given us his spirit. Again, that spirit of promise, the guarantee. And we have seen and testify uh, that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he is in God. And we have been known and we have known and believe that the love that God has for us, God is love. And he uh, who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Now, it sounds like a lot of back and forth there, but let me kind of get to you, uh, break it down for you. He's saying that we see God through his love. As his love is manifested to us, that's what shows us his love for us. It, it, God is manifested through his love. He is, God is love. He can say and do nothing more than that character of love. If he did something outside of that, it would make us scratch our head and wonder, well, is that God? Because that's not really showing love. A lot of, a lot of non-believers and people in the world use the same thing. How can a God of love do X, Y, Z? How can a God of love let little children get sick? How can a lo uh, the love of God create war between people? How can the love of God allow racism on the planet? How can the love of God allow diseases and sickness to ravage the world? That's not God. Remember this, that was not God's original plan. Sin, sickness, death, war, hatred, racism, and all the other junk that goes with it, that's a result of man's disobedience to God since the Garden of Eden, and now it's populated the earth. God sees it. God's made allowance for it, but he's also made a way of escape from it in his son, Jesus Christ. So even though he allowed man to make their own choice, and man made the wrong direction. As Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray, everyone to his own way, but God has laid upon him, meaning Christ, the iniquity of us all. This is what he's saying. And people uh, uh, see God um, whom they see. You see, people see God when they see his love in and through us. That's the point I wanted to make. God's love is manifested to others when they see it in us and how we conduct ourselves and how we love other people. That's a true statement. You'll know my disciples, Jesus said, you'll know my disciples by their love for one another. And he's not just talking about love of other Christians, a love for other people. You'll know my disciples, or those who truly love me, by their love for other people. And think about that truly. Let me read this to you in 1 John 3.16. By this we know love. Because he had laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Again, going back to the sacrificial thing. Now, he's not telling us to die. In some cases, it might be. I know a person that they uh, gave some of their bodily organs to save a child. They did prolong the life of that child, and eventually they did die, but they gave them themselves literally. They said, hey, I've lived a good life. I have healthy organs, and they gave their organs to donate to a young child, and thus that child lived and survived a deadly disease. But think about this. Not too many people are willing to do that today. Not too many people are willing to stand in the place of those that are weaker or hurting or hungry and say, I'm going to be Jesus in the flesh, literally act out the, the, the love of Jesus in the flesh, for those people. That's, I think, where the church kind of misses in translation when it comes to the word versus the conduct or the action or the practicality of it. This is what he's saying here. Um, in First John, I'm sorry, in Romans chapter 5, 5 and 6, now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given us, he says, has given to us. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Again, going back to that. He shows his love in that while we are still dead in our trespasses and sins, he died for us. That shows us his love. And might, that, might I say that that shows our love for other people. Can we love sinners? Absolutely. We have to love sinners like God loves sinners. If, if we saw somebody and they're hurting and messed up, and I've been there myself, and you, and you reach out to these people, and they look at you like, why are you being so nice to me? Like, don't you know what I am? Yeah, I know exactly what you are because I used to be there but I want to tell you why I'm doing this. And then you share with them the love of God and then you manifest it through your conduct. That's going to win people to Jesus. If we put off people because, oh, that, that guy's a drug addict, or that guy's a, an alcoholic, that, that, that person's a, an adulterer or a fornicator or whatever, 
we all were at one time. But we're not now, and hopefully we'll not, we'll, we'll not be in the future, but through the love of God who manifests himself to us and transformed and changed us, if we love those sinners, those sinners will become saints. And then those saints will turn around and save more sinners. You get what I'm saying? The same thing with the disciples. We're to emulate that love of God, you guys. In Philippians 2, verses 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. There's a long passage here in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, and also 9 through 21. I'm not going to read it all, but literally, if you read that, it's talking about being living sacrifices. And Paul uses that whole thing about how we need to esteem others more than ourselves, that we need to be living sacrifices, not dead ones, in our words, in our, sp- our conduct, in our speech. And I'll let you read that or, uh, another time. In 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 13, he says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Notice that those are all external things. Until I come, give attention to reading, exhortation, and doctrine. In other words, you need to know what God's word says. You need to know what God is saying to you and to others. And then you need to know how to what? To teach it to other people. He says, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by the prophecy with the laying on in the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. In other words, continue to go over these things over and over again. Give yourselves entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. And I like this part here. Here's how the love of God is perfected. Verses 17 through 19. Look what he says. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love, uh, we love him because he first loved us. How, how can I say that love is perfected in here? Because he says it right here. Love has been perfected in this way, that now we have boldness to enter into the throne room of grace. Now, this is, again, another Old Testament uh, illustration. Remember I told you about the priest going in behind the curtain? Well, only the high priest was able to do that. But now because of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for you and me, you and I, the Bible says, can go, go boldly before the throne room of grace. We can, that curtain has been torn down. It literally did when Jesus was died on the cross. That curtain literally was torn in half from the top to the bottom, thus God signaling no longer does only a priest go. Now, now anybody can come before him because the, that curtain, that veil that was hanging is the body of Jesus Christ. And it was broken on the cross, and this thing was torn in half. Now you have access to me because of my son, Jesus Christ. And I like what he's saying here. He's saying, perfect love casts out all fear. You don't have to be afraid whether you're going to go to heaven or not. You don't have to afraid, be afraid whether you're just the most perfect Christian, because you're not, I'm not, and we never will be. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fall on our face multiple times. But here's the beauty of it. If you fall on your face a million times, you're going to get up a million and one. You're going to go before the throne room of grace and say, God, forgive me. I've sinned. I've, I've, I've misrepresented you, whatever the case may be and say, God, forgive me and cleanse me by your blood. And then you get up and you start walking forward again. Don't let the enemy beat you down. Don't be condemned. The Bible says no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because that's his greatest weapon is to condemn us and make us feel like we're second-class citizens, that it's all a lie and that God doesn't love us. That's a lie. That's the spirit of the Antichrist, right? But love has been perfected in this, that we have boldness in the day of judgment. We're going to stand before God in in the day of judgment and not be ashamed. Because because as he is, meaning glorified in this world, so we shall be. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear because fear involves torment. But we know there is no torment for us, right? But he who fears has not been perfect in the love, and we have him because he, we love him because he first loved us. If we believe in God, then we are saved, right? In John 1.12. But as many as received him, and them he gave them the right and authority to become children of God to those who believe in his name. John 3.36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son does not, ha- does not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John 5.24. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, 
and shall not come into judgment, but, the, but has passed from death to life. God has not given us a spirit of fear, right? We know this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. In other words, a strong mind. We are adopted by God, and we don't need to fear Him anymore. Romans 8, 14 through 15 says this. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, which literally means Papa. See how personal that is? When we realize that we've been rescued by an amazing God, we can cry out, thank you, Papa. That's a beautiful thing. We don't need to fear His coming if we're abiding in Him. We don't need to fear the coming of the Lord if we're walking right with God. I like what he says in 1 John 2, 28 and 29. And now, little children, abide in Him that when He appears, we also might have confidence and not be ashamed before, God, before Him at His coming. And if you know this, that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Look at that. He's saying practice makes perfect. And this, this is the same thing when it comes to the Lord. You practice righteousness and you'll stand before him perfected in the end. Last p- point, you guys, that God's love needs to be tested. Hmm. Certain things. God's love is tested. But not in the sense of like, I need to test God's love, put God to the test. No. God's love is tested in us. God's love is in us, right? And God's love in us is tested through those who are close to us and those that aren't. In other words, by non-believers as well. God's love in us is tested through those who are closest to us and those who are outside of us. They're watching and they want to see, is this God's love real? Is this God that they believe in real? Well, let me see it through their conduct and their action. I wrote a few verses here. And look what he says in verses 20 through 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he, does not, he who does not love his brother uh, has, has, that whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this is the commandment we have heard from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Now again, the word brother doesn't mean your own flesh and blood brother. He literally means other people. He's talking about fellow human beings. 1 John 2, 9-11 He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. And he who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the the darkness has blinded his eyes. And 1 John um, 3.14 says this, And we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brethren abides in death, and whoever hates his brethren is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? That's a good question. How can we say that we love God, but yet we're not willing to help people that are created in his image? I'm not saying we got to go out and help every single person. But when God brings somebody in your attention and you know it's of God and you're supposed to help that person and you don't, whether it be physically, emotionally, spiritually, monetarily, and we don't help them, that's sin on our part because God has called us to do that. How many times did Jesus see people sitting in front of the temple, maimed, uh, sick, and needed, demon-possessed, and yet we need to lay hands on those people and pray for them in Jesus. And not be afraid that maybe their their sickness is going to get on me or maybe that person's demon is going to jump to me. That's not going to happen. God calls us to be those people of faith, to live by faith and show forth the love of God in everything that we say and do. And I'll say this, in Romans 5, 8 and 9, but God demonstrated his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, in other words, much more than, he says, having now been justified by his blood, we should be saved from the wrath through him. He's literally saying that God showed his love towards us that when we were sent sinners, he died for us. And he also lived for us. But how much more so do we need to live for other people? You guys, God loves us and created us in his image. How much more, do you guys, do we need to imitate him and our loving service to him and to each other and to the world around us, you guys? God help us to reflect him in all that we say and all that we do and all that we are for his glory, you guys. God loves you. He loves you so much. He loves you so much. He, he lived and died and lives again for us that we might know him 
we might manifest that love through our lives. God, help us to do so. And God bless you guys. Let's pray. Lord, bless these young people. Bless all those that have checked in tonight. And I pray that you would continue to manifest your love to us, manifest your love in us, and manifest your love through us that we could be your disciples that truly are walking in light, walking in love, and walking in faith. Bless your people who are called by your name and have your will done in each and everything that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you guys. Stay tuned, and we will see you next week. See you soon.